Blog Talk Radio. You are listening to the McCarthy Project live. Uh, been on the show quite frequently, you know, from that standpoint. And we are excited to have her on the whole show today to talk about, because today we're going to be talking about the role of music in sports. You know, and I think it's something that really has changed over the last probably, gosh, only relatively recently, probably four or five years when all the kids started to get phones. You know what I mean? Where there was, you know, I, I don't know, what were you raised on? I was raised on little 75s, you know, and 33, I mean, records, you know? So yeah. that's how we bought our singles, if you will. But yeah. um, in this day and age, the MP3 player has become a staple in almost every, uh, I guess, shot, you know, related to... Um, like when an athlete's walking into the stadium, you know, or something yeah. like that, they always got yep. their headphones on. Well, how were you raised in? What was your role in music, and how do you view it? Oh, definitely. Um, I mean, I had the CDs, and then I think the MP3 you know, came more um, at the uh, end of high school to early college, or at least up to, you know, Wisconsin area. I think it was probably more prevalent in other <laughs> not, not in, uh, you know, bigger areas. Um but, uh, but, yeah, you know, it was kind of one of those things where it was definitely the role of, of music in the in the weight room. You know, I, I, I laugh because um, I, I don't necessarily look, you know, I look, I look like a Midwest girl, um, kind of sweet and innocent or whatever, but I like hardcore rock and hardcore rap, and, and I listen to a lot of rap um, and enjoy the, the, the music to get you going. You know, that's what I'm, I'm listening to on the way to work. You know, I like I like inspirational rap, which is going to be awesome to talk to Thistle today, and 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 stuff like that. I don't I don't like you know the the stuff where they're not really saying anything, but um, just just the the point of you know talking and telling their story and and how they got out of things and and also just the music itself. Um, we did a I took a sports psychology class in college and. We actually had to listen to a bunch of different music and 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 make up a um, almost like a training session or whatever um, or a or whole you know what what songs would we use for um, you know relaxation to and stuff and I, I laugh because for every person that's different a lot of times my athletes um, they they will fall asleep to the hardcore rap you know that's that's their you know, relaxing music, which is oh. is crazy, you know. So to everybody it's a little different. But to me, you know, just because I think I was, when I hear hardcore rock, um, I think weightlifting. I think the gym. Yeah, so, but that's not that's not always the case. That's not what everybody listens to when they're, you know. Um, I've been part of a, a lot of different age groups in gyms, and, and uh, it's funny to what, people want to listen to when they work out um, or when they're getting ready, you know, and, and could be completely different. You, you know, some of my players love classical music. So, like I said, just because what the person looks like doesn't always, or what they're, you know, you think football player, you think, you know, rock and rap and some hardcore music. And, and some of them really like really soft music. So it, it's it's kind of cool to the you know, the spectrum of what people listen to, but it is big in sports, so. You know, that's one thing that you look at it is that there really are a lot of different forms, you know, from that standpoint. But, you know, we sit there and look at the stereotype, you know what I mean, of, you know, this big dude walking into the stadium with these headphones on and you see him bobbing his head and you just assume, <laughs> you know, that he's got yeah. some, you know, hardcore, you know, rock and roll or something like that because it seems yeah. like it, it it really is prevalent in the weight room. And it, it, it's funny because, you know, as, a, as an older gentleman, you know, I mean, I, I get into and they're still listening to a lot of really trashy stuff, you know, like ACDC and, yep. and it just has become the standard, you know, rather than, than um, something with some sort of a message. You know, and you even yeah. get back, you know, even into like, you know, the Keisha song, you know, Die Young, you know what I mean? And 
Yeah. And it's funny because how prevalent that 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 song became until one day I watched the video. And, you know, and you just assume. I mean, it's not the best subject, obviously, to be taught. You know, whenever I want to die young or something like this. But you just don't, you don't kind of put the whole picture until you watch what she intended the message to be, and you're like, yeah. um, it's, it's, it's a jaw dropper. I don't know. Have you seen the video? I have not actually. Uh, I mean, it'll make your you 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 you, you will you will fall over. I I, really? I, I mean I, I don't. <laughs> I don't guarantee you, but I mean, you will follow yeah. because it is the most amazing thing that I've ever seen. Is that it literally is about everything that you don't want your kids to be listening. Yeah. And and it becomes you know, a top ten hit or and, and and played across almost every station. You know, yeah. You know, that plays that kind of music, and it really is uh, a difficult thing to get around. And what type of message are we putting into our kids? What kind of mm-hmm. message are we putting into our athletes? So really, it does, in my mind, become a big question about the subject matter. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of a lot of people, you know, it's kind of one of those things where um, sometimes they, they the parents see the genre in which um, or the music type. You know, my husband and I constantly are are uh, back and forth about what the boys should listen to, and he listens to country, and I like rap. Uh, but I feel that there can be some really inspirational things that come out of it and that not talking, you know, there's certain stuff that isn't, you know, and, and that's what, you know, this whole kind of bringing it in, you know, in, in the positive side of things, which is really great. Um, but it, it's funny because, you know, some of the country songs, just because there's a twang there, um, doesn't mean they're talking about things that I want my boys listening to. You know, so it's kind of funny that some we see certain certain genres as good and certain genres as bad, and it's all about listening to what the lyrics are and what they're saying, and you can get lost in the beat a little bit and uh, and and really, um, you know, what what type of music is good and what type of music is bad, you know. Exactly. So exactly. It, it's good, you know, but with the sports realm, it, it you know, they're going to be immersed in it. But there's, you know, those classic songs that everyone plays at the fields and, you know, during the games and, <laughs> exactly. and, and stuff like that. So that's cool. cool. All righty. Well, let's um, – we're going to kind of change gears because um, today we have Thistle on the on the show with us today. And he has the very unique perspective, I think, of becoming um, – I mean, one of his – key lines on his bio is ex-hustler turned urban missionary. And I think that is probably the coolest mm-hmm. thought because really I, I look at music in that way, in that sense that you're trying to communicate a message to people and and, and it's used in that way. So yeah. I think um, it really is a neat thing. But this will, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, man. How about yourself? Doing very well, doing very well. Well, you've been listening a little bit to what we've been talking about related to the role of, of music in sport. I think you are part of, like, I, I think, and I'll kind of give you a little more information about how I, I kind of, um, I, I know about your music, is that my son uh, was a big listener, and I always, he would always want to turn it on in the car, and it took me a while to slow my brain down to understand what the words were, and I thought, this is cool <laughs> stuff. <laughs> because when you're uh, a little bit uh, on the older side of life, um, you guys talk way too fast. Did you know that? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so from that standpoint, um, I, the, the two songs that I got hooked on was I'm Ready and Step Off. And I thought the message was unbelievably great. I mean, I use them before the show um, as my little motivational thing to kind of get myself rolling. And I was um, totally thrilled when you had uh, were interested in coming on the show because I think your your message is clear and it, it really is a clean message, you know, from that standpoint. What is the kind of the motivation behind why you uh, – what, what do you see in sport and music and what you do together? Uh, it's funny that that's the question because um, uh, my label that I'm on is a full-ride music group, and um, one, of our, one of our branding points was – we knew that music and sports go together probably uh, just
taste as good as anything in the world. So it's like coffee and um, and sugar and <laughs> coffee and coffee cream. And and <laughs> right. So it's like or coffee and donuts, depending on who yes. you are. So, <laughs> so um, that was one of our tie-in points uh, with the full ride name because you got college, full ride scholarships, so on and so forth. Um, and one, because athletes use music to pump themselves up before games. They use it to work out. Um, people that are not athletes use um, music to work out. So that's why I think music and sports tie in so well, because when you make hype songs, it, it is used for that type of motivation. But um, the reason that it, music is, is and sports are that influential, especially in the urban culture, is because they push one another. So you'll see the you'll see athletes that wish they were rappers, but because they can't rap, they want to hang out with rappers and singers. And then you'll see rappers and singers that wish they were athletes. So they hang out <laughs> with the athletes because yeah. they know they can't do what they do. So then you got the rapper, you got the rapper. Now his favorite player is. LeBron James because him and LeBron hang out, so he always shouting out LeBron and, and he at the game and he court side and then LeBron doing the same thing. Go get my boy new mixtape and and so on and so forth. But I think one of the things that um, athletes and musicians don't take into consideration is the type of influence that both of them have on kids that are listening. They don't they don't consider it. Everybody everybody says it's just my job. I'm just doing something. But no one, everybody, everyone in the urban context, suburban context, I don't care if you live on Mars, you know how much of an impact music has on people. Well, the, funny thing to me, the funny thing to me when I look at uh, particularly your music is that in my mind, my mind works that way. I like um, what I would define as a hard, aggressive message. Not yeah. playing punches, not you know, uh, like a lullaby, if you will. You know, the idea of having your war clothes on and I'm ready. I got my mind right. I got my grind right. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm set. You know, I'm set up. I'm ready. You know, that to me is what sport is about. Yeah. You know, and was that on purpose or was that something yeah, that you when kind I, of? when I made okay. that, that was on purpose because I okay. like the, I, I like tones. I also make music that I would like to hear. So, okay. but I, I make songs that I, I like Anthony songs. Like my favorite movies are Gladiator, Braveheart, you know, like Troy. Like I love movies like that. I love anthem type things. Like so, when I make songs, I make songs that I would I would like to hear if I was about to go play a sport or I was about to uh, go and work out in the gym. So. I'm ready was that it was intentionally done like that, and I don't know how you guys feel about uh, MMA, but one of my friends, he's a, he's an MMA fighter, and okay. he's actually he fights in the UFC, and that's actually the song he's gonna walk out to at his next fight nice. because he hey, listens yeah. to it when he works out when he trains, and that was intentional because like I said with the with the branding of the company, we we understood that at that point we're like man sports and music go together perfect. So why not? Well, let's let's tap into that. Like, cause I wish I was. I wish I could play football. Like, I wish I could have played football. I wish I could do MMA. But I, I know I'm not gonna go out there and get beat down to try to prove the point. So since I can't, I'm well, gonna contribute to the us, sports and world. We'll get you to play football. <laughs> right. I'm gonna contribute to the sports world the best way I can. So, yeah, that was intentional. It was intentionally done. Yes. Well, and now tell us about Step Off because I think that's another great song that has that same um, mindset to me. Is that you know, so many people would associate Snap Off with a negative thing. Well, you're just snapping off all the time or something like that. Yeah. But you've turned it around to be a positive thing, and that you can use that emotion in 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 the proper way. Tell us a little bit about that. If you if you go on, if anybody that's ever saw one of my concerts or or concerts that we do on YouTube. Um, it's a po totally positive environment. The music is positive. But if you see it in action, 
Like it, it's it's just hype. It's hype music at certain points, and crowds of people like just going crazy. So yep. when when the concerts would be over, I would always say to somebody else, or somebody would say to me, like, "Man, we just snapped off." And so it kind of became a catchphrase, where it's like, "Man, I'm on my way to uh, Toronto, Canada. We about to snap off. Or, I'm, I'm on my way to Texas. We about to snap off." So when I went to work on uh, the new album, I was like, "Man, like we about to snap off." And, and so that's actually how the song came about. But when I was doing the song, the funny thing is, when I was doing the song, because of the the energy of the production. And all of that when I was when I was writing the song, and I, I did the hook first, and I was like, "We about to snap off, snap off." In my head, I was like, "Yo, can't you hear this on like ESPN or something, like <laughs> like on the sports reel, like because it's always hype music. It's, it's always a certain kind of song, and you see the like in my head, I'm picturing like the the, the highlight reels and the and dunks and all of that. We about to snap off, so." When I went into writing a song, that's why in the in the, in the verses you'll hear sports uh, correlations. In the verse yeah. I said, uh, "Game clock on twenty four, whole team on the four on the floor, and we about to go hard like we in the final four with our guard on the line plus the game tied. Like when he make the shot, we about to lose our mind. We about to snap off. So like that's why the song has sports correlations in it because." I was like, yo, this sounds like some of you heard on ESPN. So, and, and I knew athletes would love it, and it was like, let's put some stuff in there that they can, that they're actually gonna get excited about. But who doesn't know that excitement? Because if you have a favorite basketball team, when, when you're sitting there watching, and, and the guard on the line, it's the, it's the it's the last you know seconds of the game, and and and, and this it's a big game, this is a Final Four game. Like when he make that shot, you gonna yell like you just got paid. Like you gonna you gonna be just as excited as the coach, as the the people in the bleachers, and you're at home watching it. So it was one of them things that it was like this makes sense. Like even with golf, like one of my friends played golf. My, my friend Bubba Watson like plays golf. Yeah. So last year when Bubba won the Masters, like this is why I never go. I never go on the golf golf course with Bubba <laughs> because I don't I don't know how to reserve my excitement. So. <laughs> yeah, you would stick out too. Yeah, yeah. I would definitely yeah, stick out <laughs> like a sore thumb. I've been, I wouldn't play with him before, and it was like me, like I got on Jordans and like a polo shirt and like a fitted hat. So, yeah, I definitely was the eyeball out, and and I didn't know how to tee or or hit or nothing. So that made it even worse. But like when he when he won the Masters, like I was at home like losing my, I lost my voice. I was so hyped in the house. Like, I lost my voice. My wife was like, what are you in there yelling for? I was like, he just won the Masters, like, all over the room. So, like, sports and, and excitement of music, like, I think it's it's beautiful when they come together at that point. Exactly. And then also, on the other hand, you know, um, you have a deeper meaning, you know, to your, to your music. It's not just about sport. You know, yeah. And could you talk to us a little bit about that? Oh um, yeah, yeah, I definitely can. I I grew up in St. Louis, uh, on the west side of St. Louis, in a in a real bad time. Now they still consider St. Louis one of the most dangerous places to live. But from a person that's lived there all all of his life, it's nowhere near as bad as it was when uh, I was growing up as a teenager. So it's no year, nowhere near as bad as it was three years ago, um, and and four whatever. But like. I grew up in an era in St. Louis where drugs were predominant, and they still are, but it was a it was a hundred times worse. Drugs were out of control. Gangs had just came in, uh, and my mom, uh, she's not anymore, but my mom was a drug addict then, and my dad was gone. So I grew up in the streets, uh, gang in gangs, doing all kind of crazy stuff, and that was that. That's why I say anyone especially in an urban culture, knows how music uh, shapes lives and impacts people. So growing up, music was the soundtrack of my life. Like when I was in the street and it, and it was the songs that were talking about what I was doing in the street, they were the songs that I would listen to to hype myself up before I go outside. Those were the songs that I would listen to while I was in the car and um, riding around doing whatever I was doing. So 
growing up like that, I understood the full uh, impact that music had on my culture and my society. And uh, around 1999, one of the the craziest things that ever happened to me, like one of my co- one of my cousins, like my cousin was my best friend in the world. His name was uh, we called him Tank. He was one of my friends killed him. So when that happened, it kind of destroyed my whole idea of of inner city hood life. Because before that point, I would have done anything for those dudes. I, I would have died for them. I would have went to jail for them. That's the way we were raised and taught to live. So when that happened, it caused me to reexamine everything in life. And one of the first things it did was made me just like, it made me go to God. And I was just like, man, God, like how do stuff like this happen? Now, take into consideration that I've done all kind of crazy stuff all of my life, but when something is done to you, it makes you understand that how serious certain situations are. Um, and at that point, I met some friends, uh, a guy who was like one of my best friends in the world now. We we just moved and, and got houses in the same neighborhood. Um, I met a friend of mine. His name is Marcus. We call him Flame. And... I started going to church, and I started learning about God, and I started reading the Bible, and, and my life just started changing dramatically. Uh, I wasn't trying to change. I didn't have any idea in my brain. Like, if you would have asked me growing up in this world, like, when I was younger, would you go to church, would you rap about stuff that was positive, I would have probably laughed at you so hard. So um, I started reading the Bible. I started going to church. I started hanging around people that were um, already – taking steps in the direction that I, I was going, uh, which was flame uh, and other guys. And, and the gospel changed my life. It changed my life. I wasn't trying. I was fighting. I was actually fighting the feeling. I wanted to continue going to the club. I wanted to continue being with several women. I wanted to continue getting high. And the more I learned, the more I read the Bible, it changed my life. And I just stopped doing certain things. I, I got up one day and said, man, I'm not doing this no more. And then I, I remember going outside one day sober. Like, I didn't start getting high and smoking weed until uh, I was later on in my age, which sounds funny because, which this isn't even later on in my age, but I didn't start getting high and smoking weed till I was like 17 or 18. So everybody around me, they were smoking weed and getting high since we was like 13, 12 years old. So I, was, I wasn't smoking weed or getting high until I was like 18, but... From 18 to 21, like I, I was extre- I, mean, I was an extremist, so I was high all the time, like every day, like all the time, all day long. When I when I woke up, I was high. I went to bed, I was high, like all day long. So once I started reading the Bible and learning it and going to church, I, I remember one day I was just like, man, I don't want to get high no more. And I stopped getting high, and I was in the house for like three days. And, and when I came outside, I'm using hood terms, so. Some people who listen to this may not know what I'm talking about when I say this, <laughs> but but anybody that's ever been in jail and, and you and you not and you're not high or you you're in a small closed in room for some days and then when you get back out everything looks bigger, like the trees look bigger, like everything looks bigger because your brain has adapted to this small environment. So it was that kind of effect for me. I was in the house two three days, didn't get high. And I come back outside and everything looks different. The grass is greener. The trees are bigger. Like, everything is just different. And I'm just looking around. And and I went outside, and for the first time in my life, I saw the effect that what I was doing had on my neighborhood. I saw how dirty it was. And I was like, man, I'm supposed to be part of the solution and not the problem. I saw the drug addicts, and for the first time, I didn't look at them as a way to make money. But I looked at them like, man, they're broken just like me, like they, they need this same savior that I'm learning about, but I can't offer them that if I'm trying to sell them drugs. So from that point, like I stopped selling drugs and I, I, I continued going to church, kept reading the Bible, and, and and as my heart changed, the stuff I rapped about in music changed. And one of the last things that kind of pushed me over the top, uh, I, I had made a CD like right before I started doing a lot of stuff, and it was like full of cursing and and guns and gangs and all of that. And, like, to my grandma, my grandma knew everything I was doing crazy in the street. But I was always her grandson. Like, this is my granny. 
And the CDs came to my granny house. I had some CDs mailed to her house. And my granny took those CDs and opened them up and listened to one. And when I got to her house, she was like, boy, I heard that CD. And it was one of those situations to where this is what a lot of people in hip-hop deal with now. Like, you have a lot of hip-hop artists that make some of the worst music in the world. They'll talk about anything, raping girls or killing people. and Like, they'll say anything in music. But if you go talk to their mothers or you talk to their grandma or somebody like that, they'll say, I'm proud of him because he's not doing this anymore. Because my grandma, she didn't care. She cared, but when she heard the CD, she just was looking and hoping, like, this. Is, hopefully this will get him out the street because I don't want him to die. So yeah. when my granny heard the songs, she was still like, I heard it, you were cursing, but she was like, I, I hope there's something you, you, you do. Now, later on, she continued to, to, to try to push me towards doing things from a spiritual point of view, but that was enough for me to know that my granny had just heard me curse for like 90 minutes on the CD. <laughs> and I was like, I'm done with rapping. So <laughs> um, at that point I stopped rapping and I, I continued to learn and learn and learn more. And then I just had a burden to communicate something to my culture, uh, to this generation that they were not hearing in music, but that they needed to hear because music is – arguably the number one vehicle to convey a message in the world. Everybody uses it. Pepsi, Coke, old, when I saw an Old Navy commercial with rap in it, I was like, it's official. Like, you can get any, you can, rap is the way to relay your message. So Absolutely. at that point, I, I started rapping it, and I started, I'm one of those uh, people, like, I rap and talk about different stuff. Like if you heard a song on my album, Baby Mamas and Broken Hearts, like yeah, I talk yeah. about situations in our in our community where uh, you have girls that have babies at 13, 14, 15, 16, by a guy that's in the street, he's, um, he's selling drugs, he's using drugs, he's going to jail. And then that leaves a child behind that's in the same environment with no father, no one to guide him, a mother that's struggling, and the only thing he sees around him is drugs to make money, and he in turn does the same thing. So I use music not only to convey the message of the gospel, but also to convey messages of social injustice that that I know people need to hear. Absolutely. Uh, so can you hang with us for another 10 minutes? i got to go to a quick commercial break. Are you? Is, would that be okay? Yes, sir. I'm fine. Okay, perfect. I'm going to go to a quick commercial break. We'll be back with Thistle. And I'm going to give his ideas on exactly what we talked about, social injustice. Five-star basketball, the leader in basketball instruction and camps. Endorsed by Michael Jordan, Dick Vitale, and Hubie Brown. And where the teaching never stops. Five Star Basketball Minnesota will be hosting a one-day instructional camp on May 18th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. and will be hosted by Five Star, The McCarthy Project, and Grassroots Hoops. For more information on the camp, visit themccarthyproject.com forward slash five dash star. XL Athlete is the leading provider of online strength and conditioning and speed development camps. For more information on their training programs and speed development camps, Visit xlathlete.com. All right, we are back. This is Stephen McCarthy uh, with Jill McGee. Jill, are you still yeah. with us? I am. I'm cool. listening. It's awesome. I thought Jill had left, man. <laughs> no, no, I'm still here. <laughs> uh, that's funny because one of the formats of this show is that um, we always want to give the guests the opportunity to talk. You know, I think so many times interviews are so quick and so, you know, so and you have to answer it and then you go to the next question and answer it, that sometimes, um, like when we had that last part there where I'm just, I'm listening with you, I'm trying to, yeah, man, I'm with that, I'm with that, you know, kind of thing, and then we both look like we're not listening. So, but we're here. Uh, Jill, do you have any questions for this one right out of the shoot? Well, I think, I mean, you know, and we're, we're changing direction to, to what, you know, his impact is and, and all that, and I just think, that's that's a big thing, you know. I'm a um, on my 
Christian and, and believer, and that's one thing, you know, growing up, I grew up in a very, very strict Baptist community, and your know, music, it was, you know, nothing is godly except for him. And <laughs> right. there's so many, you know, it's how are we supposed to get that generation to, you know, like that, I didn't want to listen to that. That's not what I wanted to listen to. And, and I liked the, the whole CD, you know, your granny. I know, and I'm not, I won't even say the rapper's name, but it was a secular rapper. And he's actually, he really isn't vulgar at all. And I remember I got the CD and I got it without my parents' permission. And it was the explicit version. And I had it in my car and my dad moved my car. And he ended up snapping the CD. And <laughs> it was like, you're not allowed to listen to that. He, he snapped <laughs> off. It was, it was <laughs> yeah, he snapped off. He, so, so, but it was all about you know. It wasn't any. I didn't feel it was anything bad, but it was a lot about talking about drugs and getting high and and stuff like that. And he said, you know, I understand that's not what you. Because I said, well, that's not what I do. I just enjoy the music, and um, because I like music that I know we were talking about before you came on, I like music that has a purpose and um, talking about life. And just because where you grew up, you know, wasn't where I grew up. Um, learning about that, that's awesome to me, you know, and, and yes. you can't ignore the culture. That is an amazing culture that, um, you know, we can't just say, well, that's that's the bad neighborhood. They should be like us. Well, guess what? In the suburban areas, people beat their wives, they do drugs, they, you know, like, yes. they, just, they might not be illegal drugs, but they do them. They get yes. them prescription. So, you know, there was, in, in my high school, like, I I live in Wisconsin, so I'm, you know, upper Midwest girl in, in small town, and, and, you know, but there was kids selling prescription drugs, and just as messed up as, as we, you know, a lot of times we look at the, the, I guess, inner city or urban areas as problem areas, and it's not, you know, and, and I love, I love um, rap, and I love the music, and I strength train to that, and um, I work with professional athletes, so I'm always listening to it and how much it affects their lives. Because um, like you said, my professional athletes want to be rappers. <laughs> yes, they're, and they're it, communicates our, it communicates our story. Yes, like, exactly. When you, when you have something that, we, we, like one of the closest things that I've ever seen to hip-hop, this may be funny to you guys, one of the closest things that I've ever seen to hip-hop in a certain light is country music. Which, like, it's funny you bring music. that up because we were talking about it right before you came on. And it's, I think it's the same, you know? Yeah. They they tell story Like, country music is grimy. Like, it's straight hood. Like, yep. country music is like, <laughs> it's like the, 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 the bar truck driving hood dudes. Yep. So it's like they telling these stories about life and stuff that they went through. And I think that's why the country music audience, it's so big, and they buy into what they do so well because there's an emotional connection, yeah. and that's the same thing with with uh, with hip hop. Like when you when you listen to uh, on my new album, I have a track called Motivation. A lot of athletes love it because in the song, I'm saying my hood love me. They say that I'm their motivation. So in my neighborhood, I'm one of the only people in my neighborhood that have ever done anything except die and go to jail. So everybody where I grew up at, they either dead, gone to jail, or they one or two of them move out of town, but everybody else is still doing the same thing they're doing. So my neighborhood, they look at me and say, man, I'm proud of you. I see what you're doing. I see how you're living your life for the Lord. And it motivates them to want to do better. So athletes, they 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 relate to that too because they're human. So, yeah. but. On the on the side of the suburb side, I, I knew that's why people from the suburban uh, neighborhoods uh, love hip hop music. If you come to one of our shows or come to one of my shows, you, you'll see that one fifty percent to sixty percent of the people in the crowd are going to be suburban and they're going to be white. They're going to be Caucasian. Fifty percent. I just had a lady at one of my shows in Houston like two weeks ago. It's on my Instagram. She had to be every bit of seventy five. No exaggeration. Nice. Like a 75-year-old uh, older white lady. And she came up to me. She waited in the autograph line. I signed something for her, and she was like, man, you were getting in. And I'm, I'm dying laughing. Because I'm like, yo, how did you get here? Like, who brought you here? But 
and and the, the beautiful thing about what I do with music and and what I do with the gospel in music is one you have two things that everybody love and need. Well, two things everybody need. Uh, when most people, when you hear you say Christian, they just instantly think you're a, a, a nut job and you're about to point them straight to hell and go off on them and talk crazy to them. So even now in the generation of culture that we're living in, uh, and it's not to take anything away from our our, our predecessors, the, the people that went before us, because they laid a foundation for us, but that's one of the things that we're even trying to repair um, amongst the people that, that I deal with directly. I know myself. We wanna. We, we're trying to present the Christian culture in the light of the the way the Bible presents it. Yep. Like Jesus, Jesus is love. He did come. He loved. He loved sinners. That's what he came for. We're all sinners. Mm -hmm. So that's the beauty of. I just had a show in Minnesota, and there were police officers there, and we were talking about the gospel. That's the beauty of what connects me to you, and connects me with the the suburban kid. That's what the beauty of what connects me with the doctor, the athlete. No matter who you are, where you are in this world, we are all sinners. We need Jesus. We need the gospel to save us. That's the beauty. Like, I can have a million dollars. I still need Jesus. I can have five dollars. I still need Jesus. So uh, that that that's the place that we all have a common ground where we all meet at. And one of the things I think that we could do, that we do with music, is we, we find that common ground and we meet. Because I have people that follow me on Twitter and come to my shows. Like, a girl ran up on me at a show I had at, at a church, like, the same one in Houston. And she ran up on me, and she was like, Thistle, man, you're the bleep, 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 bleep. And I was like, yeah, cool. So... It, it's it's a common ground, but I didn't I didn't like stone her to death and say don't you dare do that you stop cursing you you don't you say that because I already recognize there's a process that's already happening mm -hmm. the fact that she's here to listen to what I just said because she loves my music shows that it's a process already happening so yeah. now in the last couple of minutes here because I really want to come um, to kind of like. Because so many young athletes put so much time and effort into the sport, you know, whether it's football, basketball, whatever, you name the sport it is, they invest a lot of time. And there always is a the potential ditch of when you gain notoriety, even in your high school, as being the good athlete, that you're going to have to make different decisions than the non-athlete, if you will. Mm -hmm. How would you... Um, how would you, what would you, what advice would you give to that young athlete that's starting to gain some of the success, wants to stay on the right path? You know, what would you give as far as advice to them to, to kind of stay on the path? Get some people around you to keep you accountable. I think one of the biggest problems that you see, I remember uh, Allen Iverson. Every time Allen Iverson got in trouble, there was a key denominator. Every time. Or he was riding with his friend and his friend had an ounce of weed. Or he was doing this with this person or whatever the case the other athletes are. You usually see them in a situation that you can sit back and look and say, this is what I say every time. I'm like, man, where are his friends at? Where are the people that say they love you in these situations? Because those are the people that you, you need around you. You're going to either have people around you that push you to do dumb stuff or you're going to have people around you that remind you and say, man, I know this seems like it's about to be real fun, but I don't think this tight tonight. I don't think you should do this. And you got to be willing willing to accept that kind of guidance. Those are the, yeah. pe those are the people that win. That's, what, that, that's my biggest advice that I can give them. Keep somebody around you, especially if you are – there are a lot of athletes that are that are athletes that have strong faith and in, in, that have strong faith in the gospel. Like you definitely got to stay connected as much as you can. Like I have a lot of friends that are athletes. Like uh, one of my one of my friends plays for uh, Butler. Um, one of my friends plays for uh, for the Bulldogs. My my one of my best friends Juan Pierre plays for the Marlins. 
uh, and on and on and on. Brett Kern plays for the Titans. Like I have a lot of friends that are Christian and are athletes, but because they travel so much, especially with baseball, what they're playing like 180 games, mm-hmm. you know. So they travel so much, they're gone so much that they can be disconnected. So you got to even find the dudes on the team that's like, all right, this ain't the dude that's wilding. I need to hook up with him. Me and him need to hook up. So when when I he see me slipping, he can get he can get on my head about it. He can he can let me know, man, pull it in. Because human nature, whether you're athlete or not, human nature says this five minutes of fun is worth me risking the rest of my life for it. That's human nature. So you you especially see that in, in the worst cases. It looks worse with athletes because they always have so much more that it looks like they have so much more to lose, especially monetary. I was in um, Thomasville, Alabama, and ran across a kid. I went to a – they brought me down there to talk to a group of kids at a a high school, and I went down to talk to a group of kids at a high school, and and there was a kid there that had just lost a full-ride scholarship because he got caught selling a $3 pill at school. You know, so it, it's like this is this is a five minute excitement that could change the rest of my life, and you got to have people around you to, to help you snap out of that. Well, see, the thing that is also interesting about it is it really is something that looks like fun, you know, and could be defined as fun, you know, but it really has a big consequence, you know, yeah. like. You know, and I've even seen it in situations where it uh, just happened um, recently where it's, it's you know, that's, I'm going to go from this, because I'm going to ask this question in a different way. Um, uh, my uh, We're from the suburbs, and my son plays on a, on a city team for basketball. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's the only white dude on the team, and therefore is, is, has very, um, he doesn't see black or white. In, in the sense that, you know, most people do. And he, how do you tie those two together? What message should people like that bring to back to their city or back to the suburbs that, you know what, it's not like you say? Because one of the things that I, I, get, I hear from you guys is that you guys have such a strong message and you bring the truth. To sit there and have a, a suburban parent talk about smoking weed, they would run for the hills. Because they're, they're, oh, that don't happen here. You know, they're in denial. How do you match that message? Does that make sense? Yeah, it it depends on the parents. Now, I think now, like, what's your name, Julie? Jill. 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 I'm Jill. sorry. That's okay. right. Okay. Now, like Jill said, growing up when she grew up in a strong, uh, I want to use the word religious. I don't want nobody to yeah. kill me though. No. Um, no, no, no. <laughs> religious background where it's like everything is rule based and we have to keep this this clean like Jesus said white outside of the cup image we're not going to pretend anything is going on mm-hmm. and you're not going to do nothing and even if you're doing something we're not going to say nothing about it you know we're not going to talk about it yeah right <laughs> so i think i think now a lot of parents have came past that point and i think they've come to the place to understand Unless you're homeschooling your kid, I think parents have come to the place to understand if I don't talk to my kids about weed, sex, drugs, whatever, they're going to learn about it at school. They're going to learn about it on the Internet, whether you put blocks on it or not. The the websites, we, we put blocks to block out the, the XXX sites, but they don't have to go there to learn about sex. So it's like... <laughs> I think parents have came to the place to understand that this is something that needs to be discussed. And and I would recommend any parent, especially once your child is getting 10, 11, 12 years old, and they're in a public environment, it's time to have some sort of conversation. But I, I see a lot of parents at this point that they, they're, they're living in the reality of what type of world we're living in, and, they, and they're accepting those convos. Like again, like you come to some of our shows, I, I, like like I, I don't I don't say stuff that a person would be like, put him off the church. Oh my God, you know. Yep. But 
I, like, I talk about all kind of stuff in my music, but I've had parents at my shows that'll be there uh, with, with four or five, uh, or like four or five kids, and they come up and say, man, thank you for what you're doing. Like, I use this to help my kids. Like, yep. I'm glad they like people like you. So the parents have now come to the place to understand, like, man, I have to engage my kids where they are. That's what a good leader does, though, of any sort. Parents are put here to lead their children. So if you're going to lead them somewhere, you can't you can't lead them somewhere if you don't know what they're dealing with. And I think a lot of parents have come to that place to understand, like, man, if I'm going to lead them to this place, I have to understand what they're talking about a little. Like you said with you and your son. Your son got in the car, he played the CD, you engaged him, and I'm on your show now. That's it. <laughs> I, uh, parents have come to their place to understand, like, I have to engage my child where they are. And I would recommend parents to engage your child where they are because you will look up and, and the, the girl will be pregnant, Lord forbid, or the boy will have somebody pregnant, and you're like, what happened? What was going on? The whole time, no, you're pretending nothing's happening or you're pretending mm. like it can't happen. I'd rather be prepared for something than unprepared. Yes. All right. This will thank you. It's all right. We've already spent almost 45 minutes. Amazing how the time flies. Thank so, you guys for having anyway, me on. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And so the, the the CD we're talking about, I'll, hold on a second, Joe. I'll, I'll let you um, kind of hop in here at the end here. Or do you have a question I should ask? No. No, I'm good. I thought you was right. gone again, man. No, I'm, like, no. hey, <laughs> I'm I'm surprisingly quiet today, but I have two hours to talk, so I'm co hosting today. Yeah, so so it's kinda nice herself. not to talk the whole time. <laughs> You're cool. I'm like, dang man, Jill don't like me. <laughs> no, I like you a lot. <laughs> Listen to your stuff all last night. It was good. Very good. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so thank the, the C D is free from the trap. Yes, yeah, sir. It's uh, you just go to imthistle dot com and um, you know connect you up with iTunes. You'll be able to get it. But I, I iTunes I also place? go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, where else could we get in touch with you? Um, Twitter at t h i s l. Um, Facebook uh, dot com slash imthistle i a m t h i s l. Yep, either one of those. And I also. Later this year, anybody that connects with me through social media, Twitter, Facebook, or the website, either one of those, later this year, probably around September, I have an autobiography that will be coming out called Free From the Yes. Yeah. We would, can we have you back when you, when you release it? Because I was listening to your interview on YouTube, and that this CD has a combination. Yeah. To it. Yeah, I would love you to come back, it. man. I would love Perfect. to come back. You, I'm going to let you read it first before you invite me back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just playing. Oh, it ain't going to be what we're talking about. <laughs> it ain't going to be that bad. It, it, I, I do think when people, um, something Jill pointed out when she said um, culture, it, it like inner city culture is a beautiful thing and it needs to be learned about. And I think a lot of people um, listen to hip-hop and go to it with that mindset that, that she has and learn culture. Uh, so that's that was one of the reasons that made me want to write the book because people that engaged me through music kept saying, like, man, I w- like you should write a book. I wish I could know the, the whole story. So yes. I don't know how many hip-hop artists or if any have ever written uh, an autobiography, but I, I, when, I was, when I was writing it, I will say, like, a lot of times when you're not from the inner city and just looking in, it, it, you can't gauge, like, the magnitude of, of what's going on. Uh, the book, I think, is going to be real informative for people in that light. And, and a lot of people I know are going to walk away from it, like, I can't believe all that stuff happened to one person. But that's the well, story think, of the inner city. Well, I think the thing that's interesting to me and what I've learned in the short time, just with my son being on that team, was I believe the city sticks closer to the truth. Things are real to them. You know what I mean? It's either yeah. in or out. Respect, no respect. You know, in Minnesota, we have a thing called Minnesota Nice, you know, and, and, and I'm going to trash Minnesotans because I think it's a farce. Somewhere along the line, we've got to be real with people so that we can be real in return. I mean, I think yeah. 
that's the part I think I enjoy about listening to your stuff is that it actually is real. You know what I mean? It has a message. It's fun. It's, and even, I'll tell you one story, and then I'll let you go, is that um, your, um, I forget her title, uh, your booking manager. You know, um, mean, gosh. yes. Well, anyways, I replied to her. I said, uh, I said, um, just wanted to confirm that we're on for Monday. And you know what she answered back? Set in stone. I'm like, whoa. Now that's the answer we want to have. <laughs> Set in stone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, that's it. that's the truth right there. You know what I mean? And that's what I enjoy. So thank you, Thistle, for coming on today. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, guys, man. See you, Jill. See yeah, you, see you later. <laughs> All right, we're going to go a quick break, and then we'll be back to talk more with Jill and get her thoughts. High Star Basketball, the leader in basketball instruction and camps. Endorsed by Michael Jordan, Dick Vitale, and Hubie Brown, and where the teaching never stops. Five Star Basketball Minnesota will be hosting a one-day instructional camp on May 18th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. and will be hosted by Five Star, The McCarthy Project, and Grassroots Hoops. For more information on the camp, visit themccarthyproject.com forward slash five dash star. XL Athlete is the leading provider of online strength and conditioning and speed development camps. For more information on their training programs and speed development camps, Visit xlathlete.com. All right, we are back. This is Stephen McCarthy and Jill McGee uh, on the McCarthy. Snap off, snap off, snap off. I'm about to snap off. When that beat drops the point, I'm about to snap off. When that beat drops the point, I'm about to snap off. When that beat drops the point, I'm about to snap off. Snap off, snap off. I'm about to snap off. We about to lose our mind, we about to snap off. 